the passage that's just been read to us is very sobering. It reminds us that suffering and persecution uh, are a part of our calling as Christians. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. And they certainly did persecute Jesus. Initially it was verbal. Um, There were the snide remarks about his birth. And I don't know if you remember, they called him son of Mary. Um, Generally a person was called the, the, the son of their father. But the implication for Jesus was, we're not really sure who your father really is. We've heard there were some questions about your birth. He was accused of being a Samaritan, uh, a mixed race heretic, and this is a terrible insult to be directed at a Jew. He was despised uh, um, because he came from Galilee, and the saying was, can anything good come out of Galilee? It was a common proverb. And I don't know if you ever get negative comments directed at you because of your race or your background, and I suspect that some of you have been subject to racist remarks or attitudes because of your place of birth or your family background, and I'm sorry when I hear stories like that. It happens in every society. Um, Discrimination and racism are found everywhere. Um, when we do our outreach in the street uh, down on, on Burke Street, there's a, a group of Muslims there, and I know them well, and sometimes I go over and greet and offer to, to shake hands with them, and they refuse. They say, you are najus, filthy, and we won't touch you or let you touch us because I'm not, not a Muslim. They also refuse to shake hands with women. Jesus suffered the same kind of uh, uh, prejudice because of his birth, uh, because of his background. So if you're suffering discrimination because of that, because of the way you look, um, because of where you were born, uh, because where your parents were born, um, then you're in good company. Jesus faced the same issues. There were also character attacks. Um, Jesus was accused of being mad. In Mark 3 it said, When Jesus' brothers heard about his preaching, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. So the story, Jesus is going around saying these um, unusual things. Uh, He's obviously gone crazy. I remember when I told my parents that I was planning to take my wife and our baby son to Pakistan to work in cross-cultural mission, my mother said those exact same words to you. You are out of your mind. And I I perversely took this as a sign from the Lord that I should go. (laughs) You'll be glad to know that in in later years, she would proudly tell her her friends about her son who was working overseas in in God's work. But that wasn't the initial response when she realised that I was going to head overseas. And sometimes it takes time for attitudes to change and we need to be patient. For Jesus, there were also the threats. Several times the people took up stones to kill him or they tried to throw him over a cliff. And different groups that normally opposed each other would combine together to try to kill Jesus. When we lived in in Yemen, periodically we would receive faxes at the office that we worked in. We were involved in um, relief and development work, doing uh, work in um, the villages, health work. And these faxes would come from the Al-Qaeda unit number 42. So presumably there were some others around. And they would say, we know who you are, we know where you work, and if you don't leave the country within 48 hours, we will send you home in a body bag. You have been warned. So what do you do with such a fax? Well, for a start, we didn't turn up at the office for 48 hours. <laughs> and then we could go and show the fax to our Yemeni friends and say, look, these guys are liars. They told us we'd be dead within 48 hours and we're still alive. Or maybe they make promises they can't keep. You clearly can't trust these guys. Or maybe they're incompetent. You can't rely on them. And so we were able to turn that into something that was positive, even though it was meant in a negative way. Jesus also faced the physical attacks. Eventually, after three years of threats um, and attempts on his life, the soldiers came for him. He wasn't taken by surprise because he had been talking with his disciples about this for months. But the treatment that he received was cruel. First they mocked him. They put a blindfold on him and then took turns slapping him saying, you're supposed to be a prophet, so prophesy. Who slapped you? Then they took the branch of a thorn bush. Thorn bush is a very uh, common in the Middle East and they made it into a circle and they forced it onto his head and they said, you're supposed to be a king, here's your crown. 
and then he was flogged. And after a couple of sham trials, he was condemned to death and then forced to carry his own cross up the heavy, uh, the heavy cross up the hill to Golgotha. He was cruelly nailed to that cross and he died a painful, excruciating death. The word excruciating derives from the Latin word for cross, crucius, referring to a, a very painful experience. And this is what Jesus went through. Most of us won't be um, called on to die for our faith, um, but throughout history, many people have done so. In this century alone, tens of thousands have been killed because of their faith in Christ. Just three, three weeks ago in Sri Lanka, over 250 people died, mostly in suicide bombings in churches while they were worshipping the Lord. I mentioned the Al-Qaeda group that was threatening to kill us. In, in our case, they were unsuccessful, but other Muslim groups were successful. In fact, it may have been the same group. Since the time we first went to Yemen, 18 Christian workers have been killed by radical Islamists. Some of these were people that we knew well, and we went along to their funerals. Others we never met. So this threat is, is real. It's very, uh, very much out there. So how do you live with opposition? It requires a big reason for staying engaged. For some, when the opposition comes, they, they withdraw. And Jesus talked about this. He spoke about the hired hand. He said, the, the man who's just being paid to look after the sheep. He said, when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. But Jesus was the good shepherd. So why did we stay for 20 years uh, in the different countries that we were working? What kept us going? When the Australian government realised that there were threats against us, um, they wrote to us and advised us to leave. And they said, you should not stay in Yemen unless you have compelling reasons. And our response was, yes, we do have a compelling reason, so we're going to stay. Well, what was that reason? What was it? Um, when Muslims would say to me, why have you come to our country? People don't come to Yemen. People don't like this country. People stay away from it if they can. Why have you come here? And I would tell them a story. I, um, uh, over the, our years working there, developed a whole series of stories. And this is one that I would tell them. I said, well... It's about a king. There was a, a powerful king who lived in a, in a luxurious palace. He was married to a beautiful queen, and they had a lovely young son who grew into become a fine young man. And everyone loved the son. The, the king and queen were very happy, and they were very proud of their son. And the kingdom was very prosperous, and all of its citizens lived uh, in peace. But one day, the king looked down from his palace and he saw in the town below a family that was begging on the streets. They were dirty, they wore ragged clothes, the children were naked, um, and the king thought, what's this? We're a prosperous kingdom. We, we don't have beggars in this place. What's going on? And so he sent uh, one of his soldiers down to find out what was going on. And the soldier came back and reported. He said, these people have come from a far country. They're refugees. There's been a famine and a war in their country, and they've come here seeking refuge. And the king was a good man. He felt pity for this family, and so he sent them some food and some clean clothes, and he also gave them some land beside the river. Um, it was, it was, the land was a free gift for them. He said, these people need to support themselves. They need somewhere to live. I'll give them this land. But they have to obey the rules of the kingdom. That is, at, at tax time, everyone gives a certain proportion of their produce to do public works around the kingdom. And the family agreed to this. They were very grateful. And uh, so they, they got to work and they started, uh, they built a little house, they started growing their crops. And during the, at the end of the first harvest, they produced a fine crop. And the king sent his uh, uh, tax collectors around to collect the taxes throughout the land. But when the tax collectors came to this family, the family said, oh no, this is our first year, we, we haven't got much, um, so we're not going to pay any taxes. And they went back up to the king, and the king said, oh, okay, first year. 
The next year, the same thing happened. They had a bumper harvest. They had much more than they could consume. And the king sent the tax collectors around. And when they came to this land, the, the people said, no, if the king wants crops, he can grow his own crops. This is ours. Well, when the king heard this, he thought, oh, maybe they don't understand what we do with the, with the finances. And so he sent his um, minister for finance down to tell them, this is how we do the budget each year. This is what we do with the money. But when they saw the minister, the minister, they actually, they beat him up and they threw him out and they said, get out of here. Well, they, he reported this back to the king and the king said, oh, clearly they don't understand. I know, I'll send my son. I'll send my only son. They will respect the prince because everyone loves the prince. And when the young prince came down there to talk to them, the family said, this man is the heir of the kingdom. If we kill him, we will inherit the land ourselves. And so they grabbed the prince and they killed him. They beat him to death with rocks and they threw his body outside their gate. Well, the people of that town were horrified at this and they didn't quite know what to do. So they took the body back up to the palace and laid it before the king. And the king was so angry. He called together his soldiers. He called the, cap the captain of the guard. He said, I want you to go and collect every soldier that you can. Call them back from, from their families, from leave. Get every weapon you can and go down to that house and destroy those people and destroy that house. Well, the queen had a different approach. She had magical powers, and she took the, the, the body of the prince into a back room, and she was able to bring him back to life. But down at the refugee's house, the, the army arrived. They surrounded the house, and they were just about to march in and destroy it when suddenly the door opened, and out walked the young prince, bloodied but alive. And then he says to the soldiers, please, don't do anything. These people are begging for mercy, and I want to be their mediator. And so he marched up to there with the soldiers, with his family, and they stood before the king. And the young prince said to his father, Father, you know these people have done a terrible thing. They have dishonored our kingdom. They've brought shame on our land. What will take away shame? And he said, we have a saying in our, in our country. And here I use an Arabic proverb which says, La yuxilil ar illa bidam. Nothing takes away shame except blood. And when I tell this to people, they go, yes, we know that saying. And the young prince says to his father, I want you to accept my blood, which is on the ground outside their property, which is on my clothes, as payment for, for what they have done. Well, the king stood up and he declared to the, to the court. He said, if anyone else had asked me to do this except for my son, I would not do it. But my son is not only their mediator, but his blood has cleansed them. And I will forgive these people. And more than that, I will invite this family now to come and live in the palace with me and, and the queen and the prince as our guests. And they can live here forever. And so the people who came to the country poor now lived in comfort. The people who brought shame on the kingdom were now living at, were now in a place of honour. Those who were the king's enemies became his friends. And all of the people of the land were amazed at that. They were amazed at the generosity of the king. They were amazed at the skill of the queen. And they were amazed at the courage and the love of, of the son. I remember telling this story to a Yemeni taxi driver one time and he said, that is such a beautiful story. He said, if only our world was like that. If only we had a leader like that. And I said, we do. I said, you know, that story is not about a king, but it's about God, a God who loves you. There's, there is a father in heaven who is committed to your growth and to, to your welfare. And despite our rebellion, despite our sin, he sends his son, Jesus Christ, into the world to reconcile us. But we treated Jesus badly when he came here. And because of our sins, Jesus was killed. So we bear the shame of Jesus' death. But the shedding of blood takes away shame. And Jesus bore that for us. And the Holy Spirit, who gave life to Jesus, also gives life to us. 
So we who should be living under a sentence of death are forgiven and we're invited to become part of God's family, to live with him from day to day, to be assured of spending eternity with him. This is such good news. This is why we stay in the country. Because of this, we could live in a dangerous situation without fear. Our destiny is secure. We didn't work for it. We didn't deserve it. It's a gracious work and it's a gift of God, a God of love towards us. And the Bible says nothing can separate us from the love of God. No matter what happens, no matter how bad things, hap- uh, no matter how bad things get, God stays with us in the midst of those situations and ultimately rescues us either from death or through death. Catherine and I have had over the years several people from refugee situations, refugee backgrounds living with us at different times. And um, typically uh, I would say to them, so what do you want to do now that you're here in Australia? And one young woman said, I would love to, um, to learn how to ride a bicycle. She said, in my country, women are not allowed to ride bicycles. We're not even allowed to drive cars. Could you teach me how to ride a bike? So I agreed to teach her. Now, she, um, the reason she didn't ride a bike was she had no idea how to ride a bike. She knew how to pedal, but she didn't know how to balance and stay upright. She didn't know how to steer, and she didn't know how to stop. These are kind of basic skills for bike riding. So we went with what she had, pedaling. And so to get her started, I would run alongside holding the bike up so it wouldn't fall over. Um, Make, holding the wheel to, to the uh, handlebars to steer it so she didn't run off the path and then when she needed to stop I'd run in front of the thing and grab the handlebars and stop the bike it get, got me very fit I don't know what it did for her <laughs> and I told her don't fear I will not let you fall over and I said and even if you do fall over I would take you to hospital <laughs> I don't know what would have happened if she ran me over because she couldn't drive me to hospital, but thankfully that never happened. But God is like that for us in the bike ride of life. God runs along beside us. He holds us up. He keeps us on the right track and he stops us from falling. And when we do fall, God takes us not to hospital but to heaven. And so that gives us this real sense that we can live without fear and we can enjoy the moment. I can tell you now that young woman is happily riding her bicycle around the streets of Brunswick and and going off to jobs that she's finding. So she's now independent. But in those first few weeks, it was like that, um, just getting her through that. We've been warned that challenges will come, that they may come in the, in the forms that I, that I mentioned earlier that Jesus followed. They could be the negative cutting comments that, that you uh, have to put up with, with the attacks on your character, um, with threats or even physical danger. The emotional ones and the psychological attacks are just as real and they're just as debilitating as the physical ones. And involved in the ministry that that we're in, often it's that sense of being overcome. Uh, Will I be able to cope with this? But it's a reminder that we're in the midst of an intense spiritual battle. But we do have resources. Jesus reminds us of the encouraging power of the Holy Spirit. He's called the Counselor. Um, my wife Catherine is a doctor and also a counsellor she, she has two jobs and many times people will come to see her because they're at their wits end either as a doctor or as a counsellor often they're suicidal um, but by careful listening and wise guidance she's able to encourage them into more healthy ways of thinking and living, living. and the Holy Spirit does that for us he is the spirit of truth he takes us he shows us the ultimate realities and teaches us about Jesus and enables us to testify about Jesus. This week we've been looking at the the Holy Trinity and Jesus' last words when he was here on earth were very Trinitarian. In Acts 1 verses 7 and 8 he says, it is not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father has set by his own authority. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and to all the ends of the earth. Our theme has been 
all of God to all of all of nation to all nations. And so now the challenge lies before us. What are we going to do? We have been called by the Father. Each of you is personally chosen by God. You have been sent by the Son who says, as the Father sent me, so I send you. And we are being equipped by the Spirit. So how are we going to respond to this? Will you take the message, this message of the love of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, into your world? It may be a clinic in Hawthorne or a classroom in Clayton, a boardroom in Box Hill, but but for some of you, it will be into places like the the jungles of Burma Burma, or the, the slums of Jakarta or perhaps a university in China. That may be where God is sending you. But wherever it is, let's pray that God, that, uh, that we might be faithful in, in this. I'd encourage you to go down and have a look at the, the missions fair um, to see some of the things that God is doing through his people around the world and just pray and open yourself up to uh, what God has, has, has prepared for you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are an awesome God who uh, is a God who has faced suffering, a God who's been through suffering, a God who knows what it is to be persecuted, um, a God who still perseveres in the midst of that. And Lord, we pray that for ourselves as we see a world which is in many ways uh, so dangerous and threatening uh, that we would be people of courage, people who are also able to go out and to stand up Um, and to speak the words of truth and grace and love and comfort to a world that's desperately in need of that. Lord, we pray you would help us to do that, whether it's here in Melbourne or another part of Australia or in some uh, other place throughout the world, this world that you've made, this world that you love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks very much, Bernie, for the (laughs) message. I'm over here hiding. Uh, There were no questions that came in this evening, so uh, you're off the hook. I'm off the hook? Yeah. All right. uh, Mm -hmm. You can head on down, and Lou is going to lead us in communion. Thank you.